half. So as hot as the water can get, I think corals can learn to adjust to it. For example, in the Arabian Persian Gulf, I'm sorry, I'm getting biased here, that uh, the corals did not bleach for eight weeks at 34 degrees centigrade, and three of those weeks are above 35. And the geological record seems to show it's never going to get above three, uh, 36. So I think it is indicating that it's within the capacity, within the range of corals to adapt to higher temperatures as long as it's not too fast. And never in geological time has it been changing as fast as it is now. It took millions of years to take that CO2 and make it into coal. And we're putting the coal into CO2 in a couple of centuries. But there's many examples where corals seem to be adapting. For example, in all of the places where there has been bleaching, the second time bleaching comes around, it is less severe, even though the temperature is just as high, which means that corals seem to show the ability to acclimate to higher temperatures and even perhaps to uh, adapt. Now, this is very confusing and colorful. Sorry about that. But here is where we are now, and it's one of the best. This is the red, I'm sorry, I should explain. The red here, or magenta, whatever that color is, is reef building by corals. These you ignore, we'll get to them later. They're not the same kind of coral. So corals start in here about 225 million years ago, and right away they started building reefs, and then there was an extinction here, a very bad mass extinction. And then corals rebounded. They're really fast. There was about a hundred new genera of coral evolved within a few million years and the reefs went up, but then they crashed again. We'll tell you why. And the bivalves took over. These are clam-like things. And then the second half, the N stands for neogene, and that's where we are now. Corals are doing very well. But in between, the corals lived there but it was the bivalves that made what you might call reefs. And this is the number of genera of coral, and the total coral diversity is the yellow. And what is odd is when they were not making reefs, remember the Cretaceous is when the bivalves were making reefs, the diversity of coral was great as ever. And so it doesn't really, the geologists tell us that where you have lots of genera or great diversity of coral and where you have big reef construction are just unrelated to each other. What is good for corals and what is good for reefs are not necessarily the same thing. And here we are now, we have a great diversity of corals, but it's not what it was. But, and when, this is a time, when, until very recently, where there was very good reef building. And here's where there has been almost no reefs and the diversity was even higher. Uh, and they're not related to each other. I like this quote from Bob Boutner, my Bob Kids. It's like obesity. A massive reef is where it's good for uh, if everything is going well, the conditions are good, like they have been in the Neogene. And it's kind of like where things are good, you've got lots of food and you can watch TV and nothing much happens. You're going to produce a byproduct fat, whereas corals, where things are very good for uh, calcification, they're going to make reefs, but it's not really relevant to the corals. But it's very important to the fish and to the other animals that need crevices and to the bioeroders, but the corals, it doesn't really matter. Now, this is an example. I got to see this, and I got those pictures myself. Uh, there was a meeting where there was a lava flow. And five years later, in 1991, there was a map of 70,000 square kilometer, a square meter, 70,000 square meter sheet of lava. And so five years later, this is what it looked like. In other words, it wasn't a coral reef, it was basalt, but the corals came back very fast and good. Corals don't need reefs, but they need good growing conditions. And this is just a bunch of examples from the literature I was too busy to read. But the coral reefs where you had very little coral after some big disaster like crown of thorns, they come back fast. 
In fact, for larvae, uh, when I put out these little settling plates made of plexiglass or terracotta, the corals settle on that very good. And I'm always in my life has wondered, why am I getting more on plexiglass and tile than on the reef? I look around, I figured maybe I just can't see them. They're just too hard to find there. They're easy to see. But recently a girl did a PhD at the University of Hawaii and found out that even though coral larvae are attracted to certain things, they are far overwhelming the attraction for some warning. In other words, if we are looking for a nice house that we want to have swimming pool, tile floors, we're attracted to it, but if it's next to a big oil refinery with lots of noise and toxic smoke, <coughs> it's going to override how nice that house is. And that's the way it seems to be for larvae. You get larvae of possiportamicorns settling on uh, tile and cement and uh, rope and everything, but it can't be evolved as that is an attraction. It's settling there because there's nothing warning it. Whereas coral reefs are kind of a, have lots of warning algae and bacteria, this girl showed. And it's more dangerous for a little larva to settle on a coral reef than it is to settle on a nice big sheet of basalt because there's fewer things that might eat it or outcompete it. And so I thought that was a real paradigm shift. But uh, once again, uh, corals will do just fine without reefs. In fact, sometimes it's even better without reefs because there's less things living there that's going to hurt it or outcompete it. Now this is um, the reason there's reef building at some time and not another. The CO or the uh, pH, there's been papers written, doesn't seem to be that important a correlation. But what is important is magnesium. Uh, the, there are the most, the three most abundant ions in seawater are sodium and chlorine, salt, and magnesium. And when the ratio of magnesium to chlorine is less than two, then you get aragonite seeds. Now, aragonite, I know this is probably new to many of you, corals are made of calcium carbonate. And calcium carbonate is also things like uh, limestone and chalk and the shells of snails and our teeth and our bones. But it comes in two forms. And it's hard to tell apart, but one of them is calcite, and that's pretty much just calcium in calcium carbonate, pure calcium. But when you get aragonite, which is what sclerotinian corals, that has magnesium in it to a large extent, and uh, not, not that much, but magnesium is in the same periodic table line as calcium, it's just the next smaller one, and so it might change the properties of calcium carbonate by having a little smaller ions in there somewhere, I don't really know. But what's happening is that when the, that you have lots of magnesium in the water, but when you're getting a lot of new land being built, a lot of seafloor, the lava sort of takes it up, like maybe basalt contains iron and magnesium, but it kind of takes it out of the seawater, and that's um, not good for corals, because corals have aragonite skeletons, and it's hard for them to precipitate or to calcify aragonite if there's not much magnesium. And so when the continents are spreading and making new land, there's all that new lava coming out, it takes up the magnesium. Now when you have supercontinents, like before the Cambrian there was Panotia, and in this period, um, 